Good afternoon and welcome to the first session of our Money uh, webinar series by the Institute of International Monetary Research in collaboration with the Vincent Centre at the University of Buckingham. I'm Dr. Juan Castaneda, Director of the IMR, and today I will be hosting Professor Jeffrey Wood. Professor Wood is a member of our Academic Advisory Council and Professor at the University of Buckingham. He has lectured in economics at the University of Warwick and at the University at City University in London, where he has been professor since 1986. He worked as the Bank of England, uh, uh, at the Bank of England as an economist and later on as a special advisor on financial stability. He has also been a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis and an economic advisor to various firms and organizations, including the New Zealand Treasury and the Central Bank of Finland. Professor Wood will discuss today debts, central banks and inflation and what insights we can learn from history. What can central banks learn from uh, other episodes of uh, increasing uh, government spending and debt in the past, after which we will allow time for Q&A with viewers at home. Both today's presentation and the Q&A uh, session will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel. You can visit our website, uh, mv-pt.org, to access this uh, session and other webinars in our series in the summer. Questions must be submitted via the chat option online and I will moderate them and address the speaker. We may not uh, have time to address all questions submitted, so if your question doesn't get answered, please email us on our inquiries email address, inquiries at mb-pt.org, and we'll pass your question on to our speaker and he will endeavor to respond. Uh, I very much want to welcome Professor Jeffrey Wood. He's a good friend of the Institute, and I couldn't think of a better person to start this series. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for accepting our invite and the floor is entirely, entirely yours. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Juan, for that big kind introduction. The subject I'm going to talk about today, I suppose, concerns debt sustainability. And it's useful to think what that means, first of all. We're talking in particular about government debt, not private sector debt. And we're concerned about situations when government debt may be rising out of control or people fear that it's rising out of control. Now, when can this happen and why is it dangerous? Well, people have, have realised many years ago that it was dangerous because they looked at experiences of very rapid inflations. The kind of inflations we had in continental Europe in the war year, in the interwar years, the kind of inflation that Venezuela is experiencing now, the kind of inflation that the US Confederacy the South experienced during the American Civil War. And they saw that in every case, these inflations were associated with very large debt and notice very large deficits. Now, is that the situation today? And what do we mean? What's useful before getting to that to consider what we mean by sustainable? Is it meaningful to say that today's debts are sustainable? It depends what we mean by sustainable is the answer. And the answer is, therefore, can governments service these debts in the future? And to think about that, we have to think about how the economy is growing and how rapidly the debt would grow if it simply stayed there without any more spending and something and nothing were done at all by the government. In that case, what matters is the rate of interest on the debt relative to the rate of growth of the economy. If the government does nothing and the rate of interest exceeds the rate of growth of the economy, then debt interest will take up more and more of the economy. Eventually, people will not buy the debt when it's being rolled over, when new debt's being issued. So they will fall back, governments will fall back on money creation and thus inflation will start. In contrast, if the interest rate is below the rate of growth, then even if the government does nothing, simply leaves the debt where it is, it will grow its way out of problems as the economy gets bigger than the national debt and the share of debt in national income therefore drops. So crucial from a technical point of view is the 
position of the rate of interest relative to the rate of, rate of growth. This can be calculated in real terms or in nominal terms. There are great perils in calculating in real terms, simply because calculating the real rate of interest is difficult, and indeed for many periods, calculating the rate of inflation is difficult. So doing the calculation in nominal terms, money terms, is much more straightforward. And when one does that and looks back to the 1980s and the 1990s, it's quite clear, I think, why people worry about debt sustainability. Because in that period, the rate of interest very clearly exceeded the rate of growth. But that has not always been the case. What has been the case is that it will be something rather different. For long periods of history, in the 19th and indeed the 20th centuries, the rate of growth exceeded the rate of interest. And it doesn't have to do so very much for the debt to be sustainable. So what matters then on this analysis is the rate of growth in nominal terms relative to the money rate of interest. Which money rate of interest? Because of course there are many money rates of interest. Well, the money rate of interest that matters is the rate of interest at which the government is financing its debt. Now that, again, could be many rates of interest because governments finance at different points in the yield curve, get different maturities for the debt. So one would simply choose a weighted average. The calculation is fairly straightforward. And just at the moment, it's quite clear that the British debt is sustainable if it looks at the growth rate relative to the rate of interest. As anyone who saves at the moment knows, rates of interest are truly, truly extraordinarily low. There are many explanations as to why that is the case. Um, none is clearly accepted, none is clearly rejected. We simply have very low rates of interest and governments are therefore very happy to borrow. This has led some people, protagonists of, mon of modern monetary theory, which is not modern, not monetary, not theory, but they call it modern monetary theory, protagonists of it say, that we can borrow without limit from the central bank. Well, that is nonsense, because of course, borrowing without limit from the central bank eventually leads to the kind of inflation that I spoke about a few moments ago. The very rapid inflations that occurred during civil wars and revolutions, and people wouldn't buy debt. But nonetheless, the debt is sustainable at the moment. We see that. Oh. An important aspect of this sustainable is not purely the economic sense, but also what political environment sustains this very low level of interest rates. And I shall come to that in the final part of my remarks, because the political environment is something which has been neglected for many years in economics, but has had much more attention paid to it in the past 10, 15, maybe even 20 years in discussions of central bank independence. As Dr. Castaneda, for example, knows, he has written on this subject. Um, the political environment is very important for central bank independence and its welcome effects for low inflation. But on the purely technical point, what we need is the rate of growth exceeds the rate of interest. And a, a simple rule could be devised in the UK context, it could be monitored by one of these so-called independent agencies, the Office for Budget Responsibility, it could observe the growth rate every year, the interest rate every year, and publish its calculations. And there would be, if these calculations were published, a formal obligation for the government to respond if we started to diverge from sustainability. And of course, the formal obligation is in a sense beside the point. Because if that rule was put, that result is published every year by the Office of Budget Responsibility, then people could see it, and if the economy was moving away from sustainability, then in turn, markets would react, and interest rates would start to rise as people became more reluctant to buy government debt. So then, on technical grounds, we have sustainability. The theory is fine. Is the theory true in practice? Sometimes I regret to say economists take something that works in practice, and ask, does it work in theory? And if it doesn't work in theory, they're not too keen in the practical result. Well, this time we're going the other way around. We have a theory which tells us when the debt can be sustained. We've defined sustainability. Industry doesn't become a bigger and bigger burden. And in consequence, we can now look at the history. The history is quite long, as incidentally is writing on this subject. People wrote on the subject of debt on the 
sustainability of debt very substantially from the early 19th, 19th century onwards. Some of the greatest, greatest economists, um, David Ricardo, for example, wrote extensively on the debt. And this has continued up to the present day when the white James Buchanan, a Nobel Prize winner, also wrote on public debt. It's a subject which has always intrigued, intrigued economists because it's been very important. It was particularly important to Ricardo because of the time he was writing. And now we come to the historical evidence. When has Britain experienced, when, when before now, to be quite clear, has Britain experienced large jumps in the stock of debt? And I speak of Britain because Britain is very useful in this context and this kind of study. Um, I have to say because Britain is an island. Because Britain is an island, its borders, its size hasn't, haven't changed very much over the centuries. And in consequence, we have fairly long runs of data as consistent as it, can, as it can be really over very long periods of time. So we can look at debt to income ratios in Britain with some comfort from the beginning of the well, late 18th, I suppose, but certainly from the beginning of the 19th century onwards. And what do we find? There were big spikes in the debt to income ratio. After the Napoleonic Wars, after the First World War, after the Second World War, three big spikes. And then, of course, again, a little spike after the banking crisis and a big spike now. So these spikes have occurred after wars and after the metaphorical war of fighting this virus. Now, it's a metaphorical war and metaphors can be very misleading. But in a particular, in this particular context, the metaphor is actually in a narrow sense, very useful indeed. But let's think what happened first. Go back to the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Let's think about 1825. An enormous national debt had been run up for a variety of reasons. The government needed revenue to fight the war. It had almost no tax revenue because tax revenue had, before the war, primarily come in from customs duties and excise duties. And it was international trade with the continent had for a large part of the, of the French Revolutionary and then the Napoleonic Wars collapsed completely. So revenue had collapsed because trade had collapsed. Income tax had been invented but wasn't bringing in very much. So the war, the war was financed by borrowers. We had a large stock of debt. Then as now, there was an active debate as to what should be done. But it was pointed out quite correctly and this debt was not going to continue growing. This debt had been incurred for a particular purpose. The purpose was passed. Government was going to go back to its own, its old, I should say, its old, uh, relatively prudent ways. I say relatively prudent because I want to digress into politics for just a moment in a second. So the debt was left and nothing was done, but the economy was allowed to grow. Now, I said the government was going to go back into its old, relatively prudent ways. A politically very important series of events started very soon after that. At the end of the 18th century, there had been discontent about the functioning of democracy. The franchise had been quite narrow. The people, the people who could vote were a very small in number. Many constituencies, many parliamentary constituencies, in effect, belonged to people. They could decide who the member of parliament would be. Because of this, there was corruption, there was inefficiency, and a corrupt, inefficient government could not fall as a result of a vote in Parliament. There was pressure against that, and a series of political reforms started in the 1820s, with the franchise being broadened, and these so-called rotten boroughs, which people owned, gradually being eliminated. The government became more open, more exposed to parliamentary pressure, and thus experienced greater pressure to efficiency, and did to honesty. This continued, this, these reforms continued gradually throughout the 19th century. And at the same time, something else continued. Debt, inter debt interest rates stayed low. The debt could be financed readily as it, as it rolled over and the economy continued to grow. The growth rate was not enormous, certainly below 2% a year, but it was faster than a higher number, a higher percentage, I should say, than the rate of interest on the debt. So the debt was gradually reduced to a share of national income and reducing, paying it off became easier and easier. And it thus drifted, drifted downwards. The debt to income ratio drifted downwards uh, um, as the century progressed. And we ended 
in the US, I suppose, just before the First World War, was really a very low debt, debt to income ratio indeed. The same thing happened after the First World War. It's more difficult to interpret the data then because, of course, after the First World War, there was a brief resumption of the gold standard and the international turmoil that came with the breaking down of the gold standard and the Great Recession in the United States, caused primarily by the actions of the Federal Reserve System and the recovery impeded by the, elect, by the election of President Roosevelt, who carried out policies which were well-meaning but misguided. But nonetheless, again, if we look at the interwar years, we see exactly the same phenomenon. We start with a high debt to income ratio. The debt to income ratio gradually falls out until the Second World War starts. Then, of course, the debt to income ratio spikes up again. After the Second World War, the treatment of the debt was rather different. There was high taxation because the newly elected Labour government wanted to do lots of things. So spending did not fall as it had done in the previous two wars. Um, but interest rates were controlled by various measures in the UK. People could not, companies could not issue shares. Um, there were restrictions on which people could invest. They couldn't invest overseas. So the rate of interest on in government securities was by these distortions kept low. <clears throat> and again, the situation was manageable. Accordingly then, the debt to income ratio failed each of these periods as a result of the government's doing nothing. Now I should make clear when I say the government did nothing, it was a conscious decision to do nothing. It decided not to spend more. Thus, there was no continual addition to the stock of debt, no additional government borrowing that was being financed by partly by taxes, but partly also by selling more securities on the market. The debt was held down because the government deliberately chose not to spend more. And that is a very, very important political choice. Because at the moment, or in Britain and indeed around the world, the finance ministers and chancellors of the Exchequer are facing the same problem, an extraordinary surge in public debt. Many are saying, but these are good things. If you can do them, you should do them all the time. Well, maybe they are, but if they're going to be paid for, they will have to be paid for by higher taxes. And this then brings us to the other part of the equation on debt sustainability. For debt sustainability, we need growth rates to exceed the rate of interest. If taxation goes up, however desirable, the activities, the money that's being spent are buying, the goods the money is being spent are buying, the taxation will affect people's behaviour. If it diverts these resources to activities that are desirable, not promoting of growth, then the growth rate will not rise, the interest rate will rise, and gradually the debt will become unsustainable. So accordingly then, if governments spend more, there is a danger that this would drive down the growth rate and in turn will make the debt unsustainable. So there is in a sense a knife edge here. If governments attempt to carry on spending, as some people are urging them to do, then they will rapidly move from a situation of debt sustainability to a situation of debt unsustainability, and that is highly dangerous. And there are also very important political factors at play here. As Dr. Castaneda will remember, he, along with two other co-authors, wrote a paper on central bank independence in small open economies. And that paper concluded that central bank independence was likely to persist longer and to deliver more favorable results in small open economies because such economies were on balance, high trust societies, people trusted the government and each other. If people cease to trust governments, if people think this government maybe isn't honest, this government maybe isn't efficient, well, they trust it to, not to meddle, to put it that way in the economy. And in turn, well, they trust it not to behave well so that the debt burden becomes unsustainable. If they distrust the government in that way, then they won't buy debt and the problems will be increased simply by the central bank having to buy the government debt and inflation taking off. So maintaining a governmental reputation for honesty, credibility, efficiency in doing what you say and doing it transparently is more important than ever in these circumstances because if it isn't, then the other problem will be triggered, not simply 
the technical problem of the ratio of rate of growth to the um, rate of interest, but the other less technical problem that people are simply unwilling to buy government debt, even though it looks sustainable, because they don't trust governments to keep it sustainable. We have then the following situation so far. We have enormous stocks of debt, but the are stocks that it isn't this government expenditure hasn't yet transformed itself into continuing programs that simply one off object injections of funds. These are perfectly sustainable in every country we've looked at under sustainable under current circumstances, but it may cease to be so. And it can cease to be so by ill luck interest rates could rise for some reason. Growth rates could collapse, but they are pretty low already. It's more chance of them going up than going down on the basis of the historical average. Or Governments could mess it up either becoming, by becoming untrustworthy or deciding they'd like to keep on spending. In all these cases, dramatic action would have to be taken sooner or later, otherwise we would end up with very rapid inflations. Now, that may seem a technical matter. What about, what's, the problem, what's the trouble with very rapid inflation? Well, the trouble is, first of all, that it impedes economic activity. And secondly, it often tends because it has big redistributional effects to promote political disturbance. It is no accident that the interwar revolutions eventually in continental Europe and indeed in Russia were associated with and exacerbated by accelerating inflations. That made the political situation more unstable, people no longer trusted the government, and thus again, eventually revolution in some countries was triggered. Surely an undesirable situation. Accordingly, then, I might conclude by saying that although the situation is in a sense a knife edge situation. Government is in a situation having to maintain credibility, having to maintain the growth rate, doing things to keep interest rates low. If it in a sense does nothing, if it does not make the spending continue, then that will happen. If it behaves otherwise, then problems will ensue. All the chancellors of the Exchequer have to do, so to speak, is sit not just on their hands, but sit on their wallets. If they do that, and things will work out all right. But if they fail to do that, and there's great political pressure for them to do so, then things can go very badly wrong indeed. And on that cheerful and optimistic note, I'd like to hand, hand back to Wand to take over the meeting again.